There are two main reasons why we induce somebody's labor. The first is because for some medical reason you really need to be delivered. And the second is what we call a social induction. Um, social inductions are inductions for reasons that really aren't strictly medical, but because you want to be induced for some reason or another. For instance, my second child, we were living in Charlotte, and we had no family there. And so my mother-in-law was going to fly out to help us. So our obstetrician induced the labor so that my mother-in-law could buy her plane ticket and know when to take off of work. That would be considered a social induction. Now, social inductions really should not be done before 39 weeks because there's a risk that the baby's lungs may not be mature. Now, apart from social inductions, there are other reasons that we induce labor. The, probably the most common one is what we call post-dates. In other words, you're too far past your due date. Now, there's very good evidence that pregnancies that go beyond 42 weeks, that becomes greater increased risk for the baby. And so we always want to get a baby delivered before 14 days past the due date. Most of us will start at about 41 weeks and talk about scheduling an induction for post-dates at that time. Uh, so that's probably the most common reason. But there are other reasons as well. Let's say that you start getting sick, for instance, you have preeclampsia or some other problem, then that would be a reason that we might want to induce your labor as well. Generally speaking, 39 weeks or later, there's really no risk um, that the baby's lungs are not going to be mature. And so that's a, uh, we always have a very low threshold for inducing people after 39 weeks. Before 39 weeks, we really have to balance the risk to the baby versus the risk of whatever the medical condition is that we're inducing you for. So that's kind of the big picture of why we induce people. Now let's talk about how we induce people. And that kind of depends on where your cervix is. In most cases, we use a cervical ripening agent, and there's several of these uh, that can be used. Uh, the most common two are Cervidil and Cytotec. And both of these are what's called prostaglandins, which are chemicals that the body normally puts out that gets the labor process started. Cervidil is medicine that's basically on the end of a shoestring that goes inside the vagina and stays there for 12 hours, and then it's pulled out. And that usually helps to what's called ripen the cervix, or get the cervix ready for labor, and sometimes even puts you into labor itself. Cytotec is another medication that does the same thing that Cervidil does, um, but it's a little bit stronger and a little bit more powerful. Now, Cytotec has kind of an interesting history. Cytotec is a very old medication. It's really a pill that's used to keep people from getting ulcers when they're on anti-inflammatory medications. And what they found when they were using this medicine is that they gave it to pregnant women, it would put them in labor. And so when this medicine was put out, there was a big warning on the package that this was not for pregnant women. Because if you took this medicine to prevent ulcers and you were pregnant, it might put you into labor. Well, it didn't, didn't take long for the obstetrical community to realize, hey, this is a great medicine to induce labor. And so people started using it for labor induction. By that time, the medicine was off patent, and so the company wasn't making any money off of it. And in fact, Cytotec is incredibly cheap to use. The problem happened several years back when the RU486 was introduced, which is the abortion medication, and Cytotec was included as part of the protocol to induce abortions with the medication. The company that made the Cytotec did not want to be involved with this, and so they sent letters out to every physician in the country saying, our medication is not approved for use in pregnancy. You should not use this medication in pregnancy. Uh, and that sort of gave Cytotec a bad name for labor induction. It sort of um, became, you know, uh, caught in the crossfire in this war between the company that made um, the Cytotec and uh, the RU486 abortion pill. The labor induction has nothing to do with that controversy, and Cytotec is very well studied and very safe for induction of labor. There's several ways that it's given. The most common way is to put it in vaginally, and usually it takes about two doses that are given every four hours or so uh, in the vagina to get labor going. The other way it can be given is orally, usually either under the tongue or up against the cheek and just letting it dissolve. It can also be given as a pill that you swallow, but that doesn't work quite as well. So those are the ways that Cytotec are used. If you go on the internet and you start searching for Cytotec, you're going to see all this crazy, scary stuff that goes back to that original controversy. But believe me, Cytotec is very safe um, and is one of the most common and powerful methods we have to induce labor. The other thing that sometimes is used is Pitocin, which also for some reason has gotten a bad name. Now, Pitocin is really the exact same chemical that your brain secretes that induces contractions in the uterus. However, Pitocin does not work very well if the cervix isn't really ready and the uterus isn't ready to accept the Pitocin. And so it's usually used as a second step after the Cervidil or the Cytotec. But sometimes we'll start off with Pitocin right away. Another thing that can be used is something called a cervical Foley. This is an interesting device. It's basically a catheter 
with a balloon on the end. And what happens is the catheter is thread through the cervix, the balloon is filled up, uh, and then the catheter is sort of stretched and taped to your leg. And that puts pressure against the cervix and mimics the baby's head against the cervix. And that actually can work quite well, although it's a little painful and sometimes a little difficult to get it initially into the right spot. This is, uh, has not really caught on that well, um, but it is a method that um, can work. There are some other methods that people have used, uh, laminaria or little seaweed sticks that go in the cervix, so that's sort of fallen out of favor. So these are the methods that we generally use for induction. So usually if you're going to be induced, a lot, often we'll bring you in the night before, use one of these agents like Cytotec or Cervidil, and basically giving you a sleeping pill and let you sleep in the hospital. The real action usually starts the next day, and that's when we would expect you to have your baby. Sometimes inductions can take longer than expected, and unfortunately this can go on sometimes for two or three days. If you're being induced for social reasons, it may be reasonable to send you home after 24 hours if it doesn't look, that th look like things are going anywhere. There's no point pushing you into a problem when the induction is really just done for social reasons. If there's medical reasons where you have to be delivered, then we sort of have to suck it up and push through, and you really need to be patient because the last thing you want is a C-section because everybody gets frustrated. The other thing about inductions is there's this common idea that inductions hurt more. I don't think that's quite accurate. I think there's a certain amount of contractions, a certain amount of pain it takes to get a baby out. Uh, and so I think that inductions are going to hurt the same as normal labor. The difference is when you, go into when you go into labor naturally, you're going about your business at home or wherever you're at, and you start having contractions, you kind of ignore them, and they sort of build up, and then you start wondering, gee, I wonder if this is labor. And then they build even more, and you're like, gee, I think I'm in labor. And then they build even more, and you start timing them, and eventually you get in the car and you come to the hospital, and well, by that time, these contractions have been going on for hours and hours and hours, and you haven't really noticed them. When you're induced, you're laying in the hospital, you're attuned to every contraction. And so in your mind, labor starts from the very first contraction. And so it seems like the labor takes a lot longer and is a lot more painful. So to me, I think that's where that difference is. So yeah, it's the perception of labor is probably more difficult with induction. The truth is, it's probably the same amount of contractions it takes to get the baby out. So that's uh, some information about inductions. Uh, you probably want to talk to your doctor about what style they use uh, and what medicines or techniques um, that they like to use in their practice. MedTwice.com